commercial uh, object-oriented database management product. Uh, it doesn't any longer, and we'll get to some of the details about that. Notice we're coming. I just went too far. I've not done one of these before, and it's not multi-level. <laughs> Uh, the slides you're seeing are the very last slides that there probably ever will be on the work that uh, we at ARCA and uh, a small group of people at Ontos did over the period from 1990, I'm just trying to think, it was probably about 1991 or 1992 through 1997 in developing a trusted um, object-oriented database management system, where trusted in this case will mean at least B1 like. There are no existing orange book, pink book, red book, yellow book, or other color book requirements for object-oriented security. And we'll have to talk about why that's the case and what some of the problems are as, as I go through the discussion. Um, I'll try to start the talk with a summary of what we claim to have achieved, then go into details of the claimed security policy and the uh, security architecture itself. Um, the original goals, these were bullets on mine instead of news, but I guess this is going to be a newsy presentation today. Um, were to prove that it could be done. Now, those of, I'm just curious, how many here have done anything at all with object-oriented something or other? Uh, how many have done things with databases? Uh, those, keep your hands up. How many have done things with relational databases? How many have done things with object-oriented databases? And you who have done something with an object-oriented database, was it a wrapper for a relational database management system, or was it really an object-oriented database management system? Or do you know? It was more relational, but it had the object twist it. Okay. That means that deep down there was a relational engine, but there was something that faked it to make it look like objects up on top. Okay. Um, that's hard. What we did was a bit harder for reasons that will come out during, during the talk. The principal difference, I may as well mention it now, between object-oriented database management and relational data management is very much the same difference as you find between the codicil data model from, I don't know, the 60s or 70s and relational database management. Codicil, if you remember, was a bunch of pointers strung together with essentially no semantics, essentially no syntax, and to find data, you've got to chase pointer chains until you think you until you find what you hope you think you wanted, because whatever it was you got, you got. Um, that difference holds in the object-oriented world of data management. Um, you don't get to form a simple query in a non-procedural programming language like SQL in general and ask for all white crows. You have to instead write a program that traces a path through the object store, retrieves records in this case, records are called instantiations or instances of objects of a given class, and interrogate through a method one of the attributes to find out if it is a crow and another attribute to find out what color it is. And so the simple non-procedural specification of the query is not present in general in uh, the object database model. Uh, this invocation of methods that I'm mentioning is done in 
various ways. Uh, one of the models that's commonly used is the small talk model in which essentially a thread in a process sends a message to a thread in some other process which consists of a set of parameters and requests that go to specified methods associated with a data type whose contents are always hidden. And so there's a flow of information which is structured in a message that is to be read and interpreted by some specified method. But the semantics of the method are not known to anything other than uh, the caller through the API and the writer of the method itself. So the operating system has no way of checking, for example, whether or not it's a well-formed message and what the message may contain. That's a very important point to remember because if one is worried about multi-level security, one might be interested in knowing what kinds of information are flowing around in a system since uh, a call from one place to another in the form of a message is literally an exfiltration of information from one domain of execution into another domain of execution. Yes? This might be a little off the track, but if queries in these object-oriented systems are so difficult, why do we want an object-oriented database? You will see some very good examples of why we want them in the slides to come. Uh, the real answer is the power of being able to specify as the thing that is, is referenced by one of these pointers, which in the object world they're not called pointers, they're called handles, uh, as an entity that does have semantics because it can only be accessed through a type manager. And so if you want to have something that is a three-dimensional representation of an object, The call is going to include things like the magnification and the point of view from the observer to the object. And the method may know how to rotate the object so that it presents the view back of the object from that particular perspective uh, point of view. You can't do that easily in a relational database. And if you want to specify in addition what colors are going to come up, whether it's high contrast, contour map from that perspective, or something else, someone may have built additional methods that are associated with that particular data class that will provide all of that magically to the caller. So the real thing is, if you were to try to do that with a database management system, you have a lot of stuff to hide underneath the engine or else you have to, as a user, suddenly go off and write some very sophisticated code. You'll also find when we get to it, which is the part I'm, I'm hiding right now, that there's a tremendous amount done with references, which literally embed other objects into objects, as opposed to making pointers to them which have to be traced as links, which result in joins in the relational model. So underneath the seeming lack of semantics that you get from the object model, uh, you end up getting back the sort of power that allows you to double click on an icon and see a sound movie or something of that sort without having to know how to write animation or what applications you need to bind to an object to get animation. Yes? Was it a specific customer for this product, or was it just ahead of its time? It was a research uh, program. A few organizations were very interested in it. One was um, Rome Laboratory, Joe Giordano in particular. The other was uh, the National Security Agency research group that Don Marks was in. Um, as I said, there were two ways of, of getting to things. One was through the passage of uh, messages. The other was the C++ model in which uh, Stolkup and others proposed using procedure calls with, with parameters, 
which of course get placed on a stack and are essentially sent the same way as messages are sent in, in systems like MOM. In reality, there isn't any difference except for the way things are uh, written down. Uh, there's a covert channel problem. There's a very, very obfuscated form of communication that a reference monitor can't parse. Uh, there were a whole bunch of other things that made it challenging as a problem to solve, which makes researchers happy. But at the same time, it looked to be the way of the future. In fact, much of uh, the modern post-80s operating system design is supportive of object models of some sort. And it appeared as if we were going to have to solve some form of object-oriented security problem sometime in the near future because objects were coming whether or not we wanted them. And so this just looked like a very useful and practical kind of, of approach uh, for us to have to derive for analysis. Um, Joe Giordano and Don Marx were both interested not just in getting a proof of concept prototype, but also doing it on a real rather than a toy object-oriented database management system. Um, that requirement tightened a little where real versus toy meant a DBMS that did the object-oriented stuff, that used the object-oriented vocabulary, but also which really implemented it rather than just doing a wrapper for a uh, relational database. And uh, thirdly, the hope was that it would be done with a company that was committed to the notion of building a commercial product and moving forward with it in the real world. Ontos uh, as a company in, uh, at the time, Burlington, Massachusetts, later in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, committed all of its uh, ultimate marketing, marketing resources toward promoting uh, TOP, the trusted Ontos prototype, uh, as a commercial product. does work. Um, so the B1-like features that we were after were called B1-like because the Air Force wouldn't fund it unless it said B1. We wouldn't do it unless we had an escape since there were no known criteria and we were trying to be honest. Um, and also because we had no idea of what would be coming, we of course boasted that we would do it with all of the B1 assurances that was a vacuously true statement, there being no known assurance for B1, other than a statement of a policy. Um, I have a right to be sardonic. B1 was intended to be C2 with training wheels. And those of you here on uh, the first lecture, the Clayton and I did Monday, will remember that uh, we said that there is no security in a, B, in a C2 system like NT. Those of you who went to demonstrations later found out why. Um, we felt very strongly, and we added to the statement of work a requirement for database integrity. Um, there has been other work, some of it uh, claimed or alleged to be a quality comparable to A1 for relational databases uh, that would implement strong protection respect to covert channels and the simple security property, but which could not strongly defend the notion of semantic integrity in the database. Uh, we felt that we had a leg up on that problem by coming out with a very different model. And uh, I think that that policy model and the way in which it worked is the major achievement of the project after we learned how to eliminate covert channels. Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, semantic integrity. What do you mean by that? Okay, there are two different forms of semantic integrity that are of interest in data management. Uh, one is the problem of whether the database can correctly and adequately represent true facts. There are 99 models of beer on the wall. It is useful as a claim only when there are, in fact, 99 countable models of beer on the wall and no extra. Um, if it's the case that the fact that there are 99 models of beer on the wall is top secret, and it's possible 
for someone with a lower clearance to perform an act such that the top secret viewers become aware instead that there are 18 bottles of beer on the wall, possibly a denial of service to rescuing a squadron on shore. Um, you've lost integrity. You've lost your basis for confidence in the database. In some of the relational least privilege models that we've seen in the past, um, you cannot tell the unclassified updater that he's violating uh, some fact that is in contradiction or you're supporting an inference channel. And so some models which implement polyinstantiation uh, try to take care of this first kind of integrity by basically saying, well, there are now two facts in the database. There's a top secret allegation that there are 99 bottles. There's an unclassified allegation that there are 18 bottles. You get problems when an unclassified observer who is very honest reports that there are now 18 bottles on the wall and is telling the truth. You know, the truth in the sense that if there were a top secret observer present, he would agree. And so in order to implement the star property, star property control as a defense against uh, an inference or uh, forward channels downward, uh, you lose some control over integrity. Uh, the second interesting problem is that in some decompositions of databases uh, into a third normal form decomposition that includes polyinstantiation, when you try to perform joins, to rebuild tuples that have been decomposed, you sometimes get juxtapositions of information that never existed in the database. And this also is considered to be poor form from an integrity point of view in the real world. And so we also attempted to avoid that form of uh, loss of integrity. And there, there have been some very interesting papers uh, addressing that second problem from, uh, I guess, the Shield primarily, uh, up at George Mason University. Uh, there have been some interesting attempts to handle uh, multi-level serialization so that you can have transactions take place which implement the so-called <coughs> acid properties in database management where you get atomicity Consistency, integrity, and durability, I think, are the ACI and D. So that in essence, uh, if I try to modify several different things in a database at the same time, I'm guaranteed that if I am allowed to perform the commit operation on my transaction, it either all commits or none of it And there won't be adverse side effects from other transactions that were going on at the same time that interfere with the, con the content and integrity of what I'm trying to do. Uh, that's a very famous problem in database management. The people at Gemsos and SRI did a very good attack on, on solving that problem uh, in coming up with a multi-level transaction model for relational databases. And Cynthia can tell you all about that. Um, going back in, um, one of the hard things was figuring out an architecture in which we could legitimately claim that we had an approximation of a reference model. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, unlike the relational world where you ask for the set of all white crows, in the object world, you ask for a set of things that are designated by handles or object IDs. Now, there's a form of obfuscation or hiding that's done in an object database management system that protects the IDs of those things that you have not yet seen. And so if you get a handle to an object instance, 
it's assumed that something has mediated the access request and what you're looking at is something that you have a right to see. So what stops him from guessing numbers and saying, give me object number 3263 again, please, thank you, having never seen 3263 in the past. Uh, if 3263 just happens to be top secret and I as a user just happen to be confidential, what do you do with my request? Do you grant it and show me the data? Do you refuse it if there is such an item as, as I've identified and say you're not authorized to see that one, in which case you're supporting a covert channel? How do you handle it so that you maintain at all times continuous control over the objects that are supposed to be protected? And some of the models that were being built for multi-level object data management at the same time, principally up at MITRE, which have three different efforts going, ran into trouble. Uh, Matt Morgan's turn over at Xerox ran into trouble uh, with possible spoofings of uh, object handles or object IDs. Um, that's also a problem in Windows NT that we didn't discuss earlier. But we've seen cases in which that can be fun. Um, compatibility with the existing commercial product was important. They were making a modest amount of money off of the product they were selling at the time. They didn't want this to cease to be compatible with the uh, legacy applications that existed. And so upward compatibility from single level to multi-level was very important in their product line. And we wanted, if nothing else, to advance the state of the art, which from our point of view included a, uh, a conclusion with documentation being a possibility that it can't be done. So we had no idea whether it could be done. For a long time, we were very, very skeptical about it being doable. And we concluded that it could be done. Okay, on the B1 light feature front, um, we provided some things to enhance the uh, non-existent B1 assurances, uh, one of which was providing a semi-formal policy model. Um, I've sent to Cynthia a copy of the paper we published at IFIP a few years ago, which gives that model. There's a scattering of mathematical symbols in it to give it the semi-formality. We did state what the invariants were that characterized secure state in the database. We characterized the set of, at the time, known legitimate transactions that could be performed on objects and object instances and class definitions. And we gave an impartial proof inductively that uh, one could establish and preserve secure state under that set of definitions. Um, we dealt with multi-level objects rather than multiple single-level objects. And so we fully supported the notion of, uh, I'm going to use the word tuple, but please remember I'm translating into relational words what is not a relational entity. The notion of a row in a database in which each of the fields in that row had a different classification and another row right after it in which all of the things in all of the fields might have different classifications. And that's tricky. One reason it's tricky is unlike the relational model where each thing that fits into a field is a simple entity, in the object world it could be another object. And that object in turn could contain two or three other objects so that the shape of the thing represented isn't just as simple as it would be if you were only looking at the pointers. The real instantiated things designated by the pointers had to be realizable at the time of the call. And so we're talking active entities sitting inside of all of the fields. And, and that adds a lot of pizzazz to it. <coughs> Some form of referential integrity. A lot of referential integrity. Uh, we had two forms of referential integrity that we had to worry about. One was the traditional relational form of referential integrity. The other 
was entity integrity in, in the strong sense. Uh, primary keys have to uniquely uh, denote exactly one thing. And uh, that becomes very difficult. And, and you'll see some of the things that came from the variations on that theme as, as we go through this. Um, we matured that particular math model over the entire length of the project. I probably wrote seven different versions that got published of the model as we found richness that we didn't think we were going to find. And so it turned out to be an extremely enjoyable and satisfying project as we met new challenges and actually found that if we pushed on them hard enough, we could solve most of them. Didn't solve all of them. Uh, with respect to discretionary access control, um, we were able to do the things that are listed on the first two bullets. I mean, we could handle individual and group, and we could handle role-based access control, but uh, the part we couldn't handle was what were the things that were being controlled. That ended up being very difficult because of the rich semantics of objects and inheritance. Uh, I noticed that many of the faculty here have the book on database uh, security by Jajodia and, uh, yeah, you, you know who I mean, uh, Italian. the Italian group. And there's a very good treatment of the problems of efficiently implementing discretionary access controls under inheritance in, the database, in an object database management system. Um, I strongly recommend that you read that chapter to get some of the texture of why it's easier to say that you do DAC than to actually figure out which form of DAC you're going to do. Uh, we experimented with a couple of them. We found no single one that we wanted to use universally acceptable, either because performance hits or limitations on expressibility of what one really wanted to say. Uh, but we did implement something that could legitimately be called DAC that was finer grain than just saying full database, not the full database. Um, audit turned out to be absolutely ungrunkable. Uh, ain't no solution. It's not a meaningful thing in an object-oriented database management system. And the reason it's not um, is that the calls on the database don't look like calls on a database. Um, people write programs. They don't write non-procedural non -non -procedural queries. And so as a result, you've got a C++ program that starts asking for a get next object until it finds what it wants. And it's got this bunch of handles returned to it that it can use later. And so from then on, it starts saying, get me object number so-and-so, or commit object number so-and-so prime. And that's not real useful, since all of these object numbers are virtual per process thread. And hence, uh, they don't connote any information that could be used by an author. You have no idea of what the program that's written that runs on a client rather than on a server is actually doing with the data. And so while one can capture lots of interesting information for future audit, one could probably never interpret what one was seeing. Okay. Um, I've covered what the issue is on object identity already. And that is this issue that you go by a handle or a moniker or a pointer to some block, some place in storage, which may be a real block or maybe a virtual block. You don't ask for Tom, the manager. Well, you can kind of, but that's a different problem than we'll get to it. Uh, the multi-level object model that we picked was C++. We decided we would support embedded object references. We would do our best to handle polymorphism, which meant different methods for accessing the same object according to classification, among other things. Why, what drove you to do that? Well, there is polymorphism in standard object database management, for the first thing. The, the second
second thing is you might have one function that returns real precise coordinates for a moving object in free space to the top secret users and very fuzzy coordinates to people in some other country. Yet you would call with exactly the same named function and the same set of parameters. Okay? So this was built into our standard support. Uh, encapsulation is just data hiding and we would handle aggregates. Now aggregates are not the aggregation problem that you find in inferential data management security. Aggregates are different forms of structures of objects um, such as dictionaries, bags, sets, lists of information. Uh, this is a very complicated multi-level security problem because you need to be able to preserve order in some cases which is consistent across security levels without supporting the notion of covert channels. And so it's, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, for integrity, uh, again, on poly instantiation management, otherwise known as cover story management, oops, just didn't do that trick this time. Um, we did want to support cover stories. So those of you who think that uh, Cynthia Irvin is a professor working here and only teaching have an unclassified view of what she really does in life. Those of us who know more about her have a different view. <laughs> I'm sorry you're not cleared for that. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, I mentioned earlier some of the problems that can come from polyinstantiation uh, caused by the star property in a multi-level relational system. You're working at top secret. You want to write something which is visible to people at the confidential level as you update the database. You can't do that because to do it would be to write down. And so if you were to write the truth at top secret because the operating system or the DBMS says you must write it at top secret. You put something in at top secret that's overclassified, but since you know it is really confidential, you'd like to get it down to confidential. How do you do that? Well, you log out and you come back and you log in and put it down in confidential or you invoke a magic thing for which B1 doesn't give you adequate assurance called the trusted cap and you try to write it that level, which causes a covert channel. Since things watching the object might notice a change and there's no active process that could have made the change. <laughs> um, there are various forms of Macbeth brought to mind at this point. It is very complicated. Uh, on the other hand, once you put the value down at confidential, other confidential users can make modifications to it, but uh, hey, who's going to take care of this top secret thing that's still lying around, which is now out of date? And if the top secret user is running, what do you show the top secret user? Well, you show him what's in the top secret tuple. How does he judge which one is which? How does he know what was written when? What is the guidance that he needs in order to do his job if he's making decisions based upon that data? Uh, we tried to address it directly and make it impossible for accidents to happen. Well, we have created users, we all know that. But at least to eliminate artifacts of the star property enforcement from forcing data to be classified at the wrong level. And I'll show you how that worked. Um, did we do anything else of value at that level? Uh, for dynamic view management, we tried to retrieve the most current view defined for a given security level at a time. And so we would sift through facts that were available at different security levels with respect to each multi-level object and consistently give the highest level consistent view of that particular object instantiation and the embedded objects it might contain. Um, as 
as far as we could, we minimized data replication, which has been a problem with polyinstantiated databases and which is an intrinsic characteristic of uh, Sintra as a multi-level relational database. Um, with respect to object references, uh, we found a way of giving unambiguous responses to all queries in which there was multi-level data present. Okay, there always has to be a diagram in one of these talks. Um, one thing that made it very much be one like is the white modules, um, all of which are part of the TCB. So it's big. Um, the operating system is shown. It is necessary that the operating system, uh, in order to accommodate what we needed to do uh, with star property management, be at least V3. And so while we're claiming V1 for the DBMS, we did have a requirement for at least a V3 trusted path in the underlying operating system. Now, the requirements for a V3 trusted path, if you don't remember, since the orange book seems to be falling out of vogue in some quarters, are that the trusted path be completely unspoofable. That is, nothing can pretend to be the trusted path to fool a user. Secondly, that it be completely isolated from any untrusted process space. Thirdly, that it be possible for the trusted path to be invoked unmistakably either by the user at any time or by the operating system TCB, or in this case the DBMS TCB, at any time. And we required all three of those properties of the uh, underlying operating system. We were intending to implement on either lock or on trusted lock at some point in the future. Mark? Yes. Again, this might be kind of naive, but uh, regarding trusted path, using any terminal that has any software in it, in any key sequence that you, you enter for the trusted path, uh, is executing some untrusted code. In this Not case, true. no. We were intending to use the trusted path to provide communications between the user himself and the GCB. And the question may well have been, do you really want to take this object, this is what it looks like, and assign the following classification to it? The issue is, if untrusted code presented that message to the user, the user wouldn't necessarily be getting the correct question. Well, or the answer introduced by the user might not get to the TCB. If it involves a keyboard somehow, there's software in the keyboard that is not... That's correct. TCB. That's correct. And that says that the keyboard name is used by the trusted path cannot be that keyboard name. So now this is a terribly strong requirement. Um, our concern was, let us axiomatize a universe in which we believe we can make strong claims about certain properties we think are important. If we could do that, could we actually achieve any of the things we really wanted to achieve as goals for the process, for, for the project? If the answer is no, then we don't need that requirement. You know, it's, it's a lot of extra cost and you still don't get anything out of it. And so we hypothesized a lot of stuff. We threw out some ideas because they didn't work. We added some ideas because we needed them and we knew we could use them. And so one of the joys of doing this kind of project is you can make it up as you go along. And uh, the Air Force was willing to take any implementation since they only needed B1 anyway. And so in the end, uh, since Trojan horses are still legal at B1, um, compartmented mode workstations are proof of that, then um, this would be useful for them and it would still be a commercial product from Ontos's point of view. Uh, as far as the architecture, a very quick overview, we had completely untrusted client applications. Those clients could be the user workstation. 
um, the users were all trusted with respect to their clearance and no further. Um, the AVM was the access validation mechanism. We weren't gutsy enough to call it a reference monitor. Um, there had to be a binder and a binder minder in order to uh, set up these virtual connections with virtual objects. And a lot of that is old Andros heritage. Um, there were basically two really important processes in the picture. I'm not clicking, so I can't quite reach them. But one of them is the server, and the other is the binder. The binder is just used to produce handles that would have uh, persistence and correctness with respect to the object store and processes. The server was really the storage manager. And the principle we tried to use was if we could find a faithful representation for data, then since TCB kernels are allowed to do multi-level paging management on a uh, trusted operating system at B3 and higher, there was no reason we couldn't use the operating system no, I'm not going to do it. Okay. There it is. There was no reason we couldn't use this in conjunction with parameters maintained here to get to file blocks down here, which contained the data structures and metadata for representing the multi-level facts. There was also no reason that we couldn't put into the server all of the policy management such that it could do actual filtering and construction of views of multi-level objects that would be passed up to users. Now that's still raw data. We weren't trying anything that advanced. And there's a schema that's produced with the C++ headers and all of that to define what all is, is really sitting there as far as what's hidden as, as data objects. Up here, you've got the application, which is where the query and the knowledge of the database is sitting for the user. That's on trusted code. We've no idea what it's doing, which is, of course, why we have no idea what audit log would contain. Uh, and then there's the user who sees whatever this produces. And so the user would write a query here, which might mean he has to bring in the C++ compiler. This, having been bound to a database with an open request in the beginning, would pass its request through an AVM server, which knew the protocols for talking to this server, the most important thing being it was trusted that a security level and other information would be sent to the server so that it could mediate in advance what things were going to be searched for. That information through the OSTCB could go down to the multi-level database, pull up the information to here. Additional filtering could be done to produce a primitive view, which would go up through here to get a bit more refinement up to the client application, which in the untrusted world would then go through the data that was retrieved to figure out whether or not this was a good record or a bad record to have retrieved. And that information ultimately would be packaged by whatever the application did for presentation to the user. So fairly straightforward and simple uh, architecture. Credibility uh, for the claim that there was a reference monitor of some sort is sitting here in that this is the only path to the data. The data really is stored just down here. It's protected by a V3 operating system. This process is made to be the type monitor for those disks and the registry, and the audit log calls are made to the operating system by the server to go here, which is protected and isolated. And so by construction, at least, especially since these could be separate computers, we could make a claim that policy was enforced. Um, the claims about compatibility are fairly straightforward. 
Um, we did worry about instance iteration. We had support for object SQL. I mentioned earlier that one normally does object database management with uh, these C++ programs that people write. Uh, OMG came up with a version of SQL mainly to support the people who were doing wrappers for relational databases so that users could write queries in something like SQL. That was just syntactic sugar because down underneath you've still got a C++ program. Uh, but support was supplied for that and the Onhos customers absolutely demanded to have aggregate support. Okay. The uh, reference monitor gave us centralized mediation. I think I've probably covered everything here. Uh, we made the client on trusted so that we would mediate everything that came from it. We, we assumed absolutely nothing valid would come and the swooping attacks and other things would come from the client or that the user was just a bad and unreliable programmer, which is equally bad. And uh, let me see. Here is a view. Now, at the top secret level, the view we're representing is an employee named Tom Jones. He's a male. He's a bit heavy, and he's making a rather lot of salary. Um, he has presented a cover story in which he's a bit lighter weight and a bit better paid. And so this is the view we would like to be able to implement uh, without doing a form of calling and sanitation that's subject to bad construction. Yes. And this is something that you said that you should sure really find as untrusted. Yes. And so when you establish a trusted path, what do you A path between the user and the TCB. So it does not go through the phone. How that's done is a different issue. I mean, in NT, even in lowly NT, there is control of the loop, which is guaranteed to bring you the ability to call up the task manager or a few other things in a way that can't be smooth. And that means that at some point, the NT kernel takes over, including the character driver and the GUI interface. So that when you click on a certain button, that click can't be spooked by untrusted software. Well, it can be an NT. We're not going to get into that here. Um, we're much more concerned about semantic information going back and forth. So it's going to have to be a much richer interface. And that's all we're saying. So okay, the problem we're solving here is letting a cover story go out over Tom Jones, which differs from the truth. But maintaining the truth, of course, at the same time. Uh, we could, of course, provide multi-level views. It could be the case that some of this information is just far too sensitive for anyone at the unclassified level to know. And so in particular, uh, we're willing to present uh, an assertion that Tom Jones is a male and that he has a specific employee number, but we're not going to talk about his weight, age, or salary. Um, up at the confidential level, we're going to allow a little bit more information to go out about the cover story, at least. At the secret level, we're willing to throw in a more sensitive piece of information like his age and a phony salary. And only at the top secret level are we willing to let out all of the facts. So those are four views we'd like to be able to maintain currently. Now, we implemented something that we called scooping until we were told it wasn't a uh, professional term, at which point we changed it to something I can't remember what we replaced it with, so um, we will use dynamic scooping, uh, which looks like scoping, I guess, um, in this. Um, in our implementation of the secret level fact, a pointer is built into the S view that goes down to where the fact really is. 
And the fact is first introduced for this cover story at the unclassified level. And so there's a tuple in storage someplace. Remember, I don't really mean tuple, but I'm going to say it here. Uh, that contains an employee number. For the confidential view, which is also made up, there is a pointer to the first time that particular fact is introduced at a level that's dominated by the C level. And in this case, it's down here. So we've got two pointers down to the 15. Um, for Tom, we get the same thing. For Jones, the same thing. For Mail, the same thing. Weight isn't even defined as an attribute at the unclassified level, and so it doesn't exist. That's somewhat different from the CVU model and other models, where if you've got a tuple defined, it's defined at all levels. You would have to introduce a join as a concept at this point if you wanted to do this in CVU. But in the schema, the metadata for this database, we have defined in our multi-level schema the fact that there's an attribute containing weight at the confidential level, and its initial value in this case is 160 kilograms or stones or something, because that means British, I guess. Um, its secret value just happens to be the same. That is, no one has defined a separate value at secret, and so there's a pointer downward to scoop from the lower value. Those pointers don't have to be put in, they're automatic. And it's just defined according to this. Nothing has been defined yet, it's defined to take its value from a lower level. And so there's a pointer down to the lower level. The 35 years and the 100K are all secret facts that don't exist in the schema at lower levels, and so they've been filled in in this case. They could also be null because no one ever assigned a value. They could also have a default value defined in the event that no one filled in a value. Those were all supported as possibilities. Now the secret client making a request is going to see a view that is derived for secret. And so we actually stored, and this is why the server had to be multi-level, it was dealing with multi-level objects. There was, in fact, exactly one instance ID for this object. And this entire thing had that particular handle, or object ID. It had values filled in at the unclassified level, and other values, in this case, filled in at the top secret level. And in all other cases, scooping is being performed downwards. And so if a secret client requested a view, the server would retrieve from this object this secret row. But this secret row points down to these values. The little blue dots here, in this case, mean that that's ground. There's nothing defined below. And so that view would be constructed on the fly. Now it might be the case that in our database we have an address for where the person lives. And that address in this case consists of a value on this end and a pointer to the object that contains the address information. And so here is the thing that has the OID associated with Tom's address. And this multi-level object contains information, one hunk of which is NYC. Nothing is shown for any of the higher levels. And of course, for the U view, you end up just taking the U element here, the one that's dominated, the maximum element dominated by the subject's clearance, which happens to be NYC. And so we end up with something that looks like Tom Jones and a pointer to NYC. And that's the only information that would be returned. On the other hand, if it's a top secret fact that Tom really lives in Orange County, then we have Tom Jones as an unclassified thing. The name never changed. 
At the unclassified level, everyone can see that there is a pointer over to an address object. And in the address object, we have polyinstantiation. But under the semantics that we and our sponsors debated for about six weeks, we finally concluded the right thing to do in this case was to give the top secret address because the user process was top secret. A secret user, on the other hand, would have gotten Tom Jones and NYC. Uh, yes, it is possible to specify precisely which level for each thing you wanted. And so there was an override for the client in the event that the client wanted to know everything that was available, the lowest thing that was available because he believed that he had a reliable source in an unclassified location that could only provide frequent updates at the unclassified level. You could specify all of that and have full control. But the defaults are the ones that were being shown. And the aggregate problem is fairly complicated. It's probably worthwhile taking a short break at this point and resuming at, say, 10 after. I can go much faster because I've laid the, the groundwork at this point. There are a couple of questions which were pretty darn important. And I guess the most important of them is, what the heck is the client? Um, the client is, as, as we showed in one of the charts, generally presumed to be untrusted. That doesn't mean, since the user is trusted and is cleared, the client has totally free reign. And so we were assuming an accredited configuration of client and server meaning that for each workstation out there, the workstation was either accredited and certified single level or multi-level. If it was either of those, it was sitting at a site that had a minimum authorized send level and a maximum authorized receive level. And those levels have to be known to the TCB in the global operating system that was shown in that, in that chart. And so it is unreasonable for the ABM to accept a request for a top secret view from a user that's logged in and unclassified. It's unreasonable for the ABM to respond to a request for a top secret view from a user who logs in a top secret from an unclassified site. And those are just axiomatic properties from our point of view of what happens within the trusted operating system. Uh, there were a number of givens of that sort that we were assuming. Uh, I didn't go through all of them here. And if, if any of those bother you as I'm talking, you should raise those as questions. Uh, the other thing was, if it's a multi-level host, where and how does this trusted path keep coming into the picture? And uh, if it was a real multi-level host, not a component of a workstation, uh, we were willing to support the notion that this multi-level host could, through the trusted path, make corrections to data at a lower level that were found to be false while operating at a higher level. Effectively, what would happen would be no different from the case in which the user was sitting with two different workstations, each of which was single level, and could cause updates to take place on two different levels of, of view, single level views of the same object. Now, how would one do this? Where did I come out with this? Wait a minute, I see an error at one level. I'm working in another level. Um, in presenting the views, in, in the picture, which was back a few slides, um, the one that was entitled Dynamic View Management, you might have noticed that each of those rows was really two rows. There was a row with values in it, and there was a row below that had pointers issuing out of it, and sometimes blue dots, and, and stuff like that. 
Um, some of that information got displayed on the user's workstation. And in particular, one thing that was always displayed was whether the view for that particular attribute was scooped or defined at that level. Those were the only two cases you could ever see. There was a value sitting in place or there was a pointer which was being followed down. Now, an interesting side question is, what if it were defined at that level? Is it possible that there's also a value beneath it? That information was also given. One wouldn't say how many, but one could at least state that this is a um, value that dominates a cover story. And so the user working with those little icons that would pop up on the display, it was a rather impressive display, it's very funny. Um, the user could, if he needed to, ask for all of the dominated views, the immediately dominated view, um, and compare values as needed using his own intuition. Uh, we felt it would be very difficult to try to solve all possible integrity problems for views. And so instead, we felt it was better to present all available information about uniqueness and validity of views that was visible from the viewer's security level and let the viewer make the decision of what he needed to do for his particular application or mission. Yes? What happens if a, a lower, like an unclass user deletes a field? How does it get rolled back up? It doesn't. If an unclassified user deletes something at unclassified, including the whole tool, he has done an act that is visible at unclassified. And what we did before we get into the metaphysics and the rococo parts of it, um, is that we would float up everything that was scooped to the next level and mark as deleted everything that was at the unclassified level. So we now have a rollbackable transaction. We can record at the, at the unclassified level what just happened. We could keep the entity in place at the unclassified level because we, with object reuse having already been done, we still need to have that place there because by definition, every object contains all the fine instantiations which may now be deleted. But there's at least a placeholder for the deleted stuff. So that we could then truthfully answer questions that would come from other unclassified users as to whether or not there was a value in that particular object. And the answer would always come back the same way. So we could get view consistency across clients. Um, if it were the case that the object were deleted but not purged, that is, the deletion was never fully committed, and Ontos had two forms of commit for the leads, then it was possible to perform reincarnation. And um, things got to be a little bit dicey when the thing that gets deleted is confidential. And you still have users in secret, and you still have users that aren't classified. We handled that case. And we could, in many cases, put back the deleted confidential and so um, the story of what happens in uh, those cases was rather intricate. We needed to support it for a lot of legacy applications of the uh, Ontos database. And so that support was all presented, including support for deleted, polyinstantiated, embedded object references. That one is a mouthful. It could be the case, in the Tom Jones example where I gave his address, that I have one kind of object that's used for the Tom Jones address at the unclassified level, 
but gee, in reality, he's a spy on a mission at the secret and higher levels. And guess what? He's on two different spy missions. One of which is secret, and the other one is higher. And so there, I could have a multi-level spy mission object for missions that are credible for him. And so I could have different information in different objects with different structures and semantics, poly instantiated through the Tom Jones object. And uh, that was where the semantics of reincarnation became really interesting. You will find when you read it that uh, Antos had not anticipated full reincarnation. They had tombstones for objects uh, that were dead. Um, we had to come up with other kinds of monuments as well to fit within their metaphors, and it became ghastly fun. <laughs> uh, the important thing, though, as a principle before going on, is in each of those cases, and probably the methodology we were following in trying to go through and evolve the policy over time, was one that involved at least three different things. One of them was, uh, can we do it at all? The other was, can we maintain consistency with customer expectations in the existing client base? The third was, can we meet customer requirements for future intended multi-level clients? And here we had an intelligence agency sponsoring the work at the same time as a Genser um, Air Force lab was sponsoring the work. And so we had very different um, funding agency requirements along with real-life commercial applications that gave us a very rich vocabulary of problems to work on. I think one of the problems that uh, has come up in database security research repeatedly is the lack of good examples to work from. Uh, very few places would tell us what to do, and so we ended up with models that have handled Star Trek until copyright violations became an issue. <laughs> that handled peanut butter uh, shipments or gun train, you know, shipments to battlefields, um, where we learned a lot about the restaurant industry as a side one. Um, what was it? You don't translate, you, you don't send uh, hamburgers without sending onions or, or something? Teresa Lunt had set up a very intricate example once in someone who had food industry experience or commissary experience commented in the middle of it, the cover story wasn't consistent. <laughs> uh, which I guess made it a condiment story. But uh, there aren't a lot of multi-level databases out there to start with. And as a result, most of the examples that have been, I hate to say, cooked up um, have been very artificial. Um, so in, in all of this work, you need to have real cases to work from, real problems, and you need to have customers that you can send, does this look like what you really want to do? What is your reaction if we were to do this? And the policy people will end up hating you for it because they keep having to go back to the drawing board and, and redefining what secure state means. But you learn a great amount by trying to do these things. The problem we kept running into was, what if an authorized imbecile deletes part of your database? How do you recover it? What do you do to reconstruct it? Uh, the other thing we had to do was break from the standard object model. And it took a lot of pain from a lot of people before we could come up with a way of doing it. Uh, the issue was there's no notion of a primary key in an object-oriented database. It's all done with these handles. And yet, uh, people don't want to remember handles. If, if they were dealing with uh, Professor Smith yesterday, they would like to be able to get back to Professor Smith today. And since they only had a virtual handle for getting to Professor Smith yesterday, it's not going to work this time when they try to use it. 
And so they wanted to have a way of specifying Professor Smith. Well, what is Professor Smith? Professor Smith is an instance of academic person, which is a refinement that is a subclass of employee, which is a subclass of person. And if Smith were a key for person, you aren't necessarily going to get the same Smith for the thing that is called academic person, unless you do something very different from what object inheritance, which would define. In particular, if you had lots of Smiths, but only one of them was a professor. Uh, it turns out the model breaks if you try to apply the same key to the professor person as you would to the superclass person. Things just don't work out right. And so we finally had to come up with the notion of key with the same semantics as relational keys had. Um, and we had to impose restrictions that that key had to be independent of uh, security levels for the multi-level object. Because you could always add in the security level to designate exactly which one of it you wanted. So there were some hard problems in dealing with the uh, object data model crowd itself. There was another set of problems that came from the Corva people. And all of these were related to this area called the end of the integrity, which we may have time to get to. You have a question. Yes, sir. To uh, go back and make sure I understood you correctly, you could, as a, as a user, you could correct change a scoop value. Is that what I heard you say? Yes. It would be the same as if you, you said had two terminals sitting there. That's right. And that's not violating a write down? No, well, because what I'm no saying is, well, first of all, there are two things. Since I can't easily go back, I'm going to write on the board. This will work. If I have my object here, and I've got T, S, C, and U. I've got some attributes, and in particular, I have Sam 4237. Forty two is wrong. Now, of course, at this level, I'm going to see what? I don't care what these things are right now. At secret, I'm going to see SAM 37. At confidential, I'm going to be seeing SAM 42. And I'm going to see SAM 42 here. Now, the problem is, I know 42 is wrong up here. And I'd like to give a bit more guidance to the people at confidential, but I don't want to give them the real truth. Okay. I can come in if I were on a different terminal, except I'd have an atomicity problem and I'd lose one of my asset properties. So if I had a real multi-level workstation, I could do this right, but I have to emulate the case where it really is two single-level workstations as far as all the side effects are concerned. What I want to do is to create, so I've got a secret subject here. And I now spawn off an independent confidential subject here that is seeing the same thing in the same physical instantiation of this multi-level object. Okay. Now I let him come in and <coughs> make a change here from this being scooped to this being static, as we call it. And he puts in Jack Denny, 39. This happened with a subject running at Confidential. That subject was visible to all other subjects running at Confidential. Therefore, there is no covert channel because everyone at Confidential could see this subject create at Confidential a value. But it's 
in a separate session on a separate terminal? It's on a separate session as if it were on a separate terminal. And the issue is it needs to be created and to persist. It needs to have had adequate lead time to get through this point. There were a number of fudging things we would do so that it wasn't something that just came up okay, and so, disappeared. So this wasn't something where you said as a secret subject, go create a confidential subject and then write this value of 39. Right. You had to say, create a confidential subject and then you had to talk to the confidential subject. Right. So the Trojan horse was not. And so the user okay. went from the appropriate keyboard that had buffers mapped to confidential, talk confidential, at the same time as he could also switch over to a secret keyboard to talk secret. And so we were just trying to accommodate two things. One, the elimination of multiple consoles. And uh, we did some of the same stuff that the um, CMW world did for the glitzy demos, which was to produce different color maps on the terminals for when you were at different levels and stuff like that. We were much simpler minded than the CMW people. The color of the entire screen changed, but didn't matter. I mean, it's still spoofable if you know about color monitors. But uh, the idea was, if you had a real multi-level terminal with multiple hard zones in the display, you might be able to do this with some assurance. <coughs> and what we were after was, what are the real ramifications? Forget about the display. What really has to happen, what are the information flow theoretic properties that you have to contend with, do those interfere with serious database management? And the answer was, this at least appeared to work. And the important thing by work was it was consistent with the other objectives of what we were trying to do in a way that wouldn't introduce an inconsistency into the database. And it didn't rely functionally upon untrusted code to do with it. On class, I saw the, the, the view on your face, Cynthia. The issue is, on classified code would indeed put it here, but coming back up here, secret could ask for a refreshed view. And if secret liked the view secret saw, then the commit operation from here through the trusted path would take care of the two at the same time. So spoofing was not possible. Other questions at this point? Okay. So we had to worry about unordered sets of objects, um, dictionaries of uh, objects, mapping tags. These are the way of talking about Professor Smith versus Mr. Smith versus the ship named Smith. Um, arrays, which were mappings of integers to object lists, which were ordered sequences of objects. There were also queues, deck queues, um, primitive vectors, uh, the C++ notion of arrays. Um, there were also instances in which ONTOS had to do things differently from C++, which had some serious glitches with pointer management in the popular available uh, implementations of this On the uh, multi-level aggregates, we had to worry about access controls for visibility. We had to worry about integrity, of course, if one is going to have an ordered list, what are the operations that can be done on the list? And the operations that were defined including it, it included inserting an element and deleting an element from anywhere within the list. That sounds like something that could support a very active cover channel. If visible as a side effect on lower levels, especially if you could add and delete objects multiple times. Um, we wanted to ensure that uh, cleared users always got a coherent and consistent view of the aggregate. Uh, that was 
commensurate with their impact as well. Okay. I'm going to speed up a little bit and see if I can get to what the picture is. Uh, these aggregate things were tricky because all of it was done with pointers. And the problem is that on the one hand, if you could represent the aggregate this way, you would indeed see these pointers for scooping and static. Um, we had another value I didn't mention, which was static immutable. You might decide that this number, whatever it is, is fixed for all time. And we would support that as well. Anyway, you could consistently have a viewed list here, a viewed list here, a viewed list here, all of which were different. The trick that was performed to try to catch up with time is we would maintain lists for what was being deleted from a level, what was being added to a level, and where. And so with those three lists, what was there to start with, what was being put in, what was being pulled out, and where, we could maintain a consistent list at any time of what was in the uh, theoretical view of the aggregate. It didn't work for all of the possible forms of aggregates that are defined in uh, multi-level or in regular object databases, but we were able to solve the problem for all but I think two of the different things that were supported by Ontos at the time. <coughs> Vectors was one of them because it had a flawed form of semantic, which Ontos didn't know was flawed until we got into trying to do our multi-level. And it then showed up as a serious flaw. And there were customers who needed the flaw. Um, we came up with something in the policy that is referred to here many times as an L instantiation. L is level. And so the L instantiation of the object is the thing that gets constructed by the server for export to the user at row L, at level L. And so here we've got the inclusion and the exclusion list that I gave you uh, intuitively. Uh, for sets, you've got something very similar. You've got the initial value, the insertions, and the removals, but you don't have to worry about where. 